This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a legendary and beloved member of Hollywood royalty who has been entertaining the world since he became a superstar teen idol in the 50s. In a stratospheric career spanning over seven decades, he's recorded over 2,600 songs and had 38 top 40 hits, spending 220 consecutive weeks with at least one song on the top 40 charts and selling close to 50 million records worldwide, earning six Grammy nominations. According to Billboard magazine, our guest currently ranks at number 10 on its list of the top recording artists of all time. And he holds the world record for being the recording artist with the longest career on the music charts, over 70 years. He <laughs> starred in 29 Hollywood movies, including April Love, State Fair, Journey to the Center of the Earth, All Hands on Deck, and many more. Throughout his career, he has hosted a number of popular TV shows. In fact, in 1957, he became the youngest person in history to have his own weekly musical variety show, The Pat Boone Chevy Showroom. He's also a number one best-selling author who's written a staggering 28 autobiographical and motivational books, and he currently stars in two nationally syndicated radio shows, The Pat Boone Hour on Sirius XM's 50s Gold Channel 72, as well as a contemporary gospel music show that airs on a number of radio stations across America. Here are some highlights from our guest's monumental career. Come in, mystery challenger, and sign in, please. Let me call you sweetheart. I'm in love with you. This land is mine. God gave this land to me. Everybody's gonna have religion and glory. Everybody's gonna be singing that story. Everybody's gonna have a wonderful time up there. Oh, glory, hallelujah. And I'll dream dreams of burning. We'll dream dreams of burning. I'll dream dreams of burning. We'll along with Pat Boone. Pat! Pat! Pat Boone! Here he comes, here he comes, swinging it too. Here he comes, here he comes, Pat Boone. Mark to the baby. Sometimes the only thing that can see us through difficult times is having faith. Coming home, coming home. Sure did you, boy. Please help me with mine. Pat Boone. Most of the world knows you as an entertainer or a movie star. But we who call you friend know that you have given most of your life to others. And they nailed him hands and feet to the cross. And he didn't have to let them do that to him. The most basic human right of all is the right to believe. We gotta take time to thank God for the good things he does for us. I had a dream that thrilled my soul. Can't we get along? Just you and I. Just you and I. We care and trust. Each other grits. Hey, grits, grits, 
bestest food there is. Say, what do I do with this stupid tattoo? Maybe one of the most important books that's on the market right now, and it's called <laughs> If. Yahoshua, Yahoshua, Yahoshua. All glory, praise, and honor to the Lamb. He shed his blood to save us, to claim us as his own. Forevermore the one, the great I am. He shed his blood to save us, to claim us as his own. Forevermore the one, the great I am. Our guest has been inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, and he is one of only a handful of iconic celebrities to have three stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. One for being a recording artist, one for making motion pictures, and one for starring on television. And if all of that weren't enough, our guest is a renowned humanitarian. He's been national spokesperson for the March of Dimes, the National Association of the Blind, and as entertainment chairman for the National Easter Seals Telethon for 18 years, he helped raise over $600 million for the disabled. His own Cambodian relief organization formed in 1979, Save the Refugee Fund, which became Mercy Corps, currently operates in 40 countries, and so far they have delivered over $1.3 billion worth of food and supplies to the needy. He also created Pat Boone World Missions, which provides vitally needed resources and assistance in Africa. I am delighted and deeply honored to welcome the legendary Pat Boone to our show. Mr. Boone, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> uh, Harvey, I, um, I am worn out. <laughs> Just listening to the introduction and very, very impressed and flattered because looking back over these, well, almost 90 years now, I, I'm reminded of what Shirley said many times, my wife, she felt she was married to triplets and she wished two of them would disappear. She'd be happy to be married to one of us, but we, <laughs> since I was living three lives that she would and she was having to tag along in all of them of course so many of the things that that i've done over the years and been involved in i didn't initiate some i did but most of those things happened to me fell on me the things i wasn't seeking but doors opened and i walked through them and uh and i had a sense from the very beginning that it was a god thing that somehow god had singled me out for some privileges and some responsibilities, because with privileges, I think, I always think, come responsibilities. Well, thank God you did walk through those doors. You know, when I look at your early days, Mr. Boone, on the Ted Mack Amateur Hour and the Arthur Godfrey Show, it seems to me that you were the original American Idol, because the public had to vote for you every week, right? I, you are so right. Yes, that was the forerunner, the, the uh, Ted Mack Amateur Hour was on Saturday night. It was first radio, but then it went to television and was a major. In fact, uh, something you wouldn't have known about, but I have done a video history of the Ted Mack Amateur Hour. It's on CD or DVD. I was pleased that they let me do the, the history of that because it was the launching pad for me when I won a talent contest in Nashville, my hometown. I'd been involved in some uh, of those contests in my hometown because it was just a fun thing to do. I was singing around Nashville and I didn't expect to win. I often came in second. The contest I did win was an East Nashville high. And I put together a odd medley of songs because I didn't know whether I wanted to sing an up-tempo song or a, a love song or a, a serious melody. Uh, that was more demanding as a song. So I thought, well, I'll do a medley. So I put together an odd medley of 
Oh, there ain't, ain't got a barrel of money. Maybe we're ragged and funny, but we'll travel along singing a song side by side. I see you singing it, and it goes right into, I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. It was an inspirational leading to, I know why I believe. Now, that was an odd medley of songs to put together, but I sang it. And the audience seemed to like it. And the judges liked it so much that I had gone thinking that I was going to come in second or third. I had already made arrangements with my parents that I would meet them at the car uh, after the contest. And I could uh, we could get out and beat the traffic leaving after the, uh, the contest. But I was out there by the car waiting. This is the truth. When somebody came to the stage door said, Pat Boone, Pat Boone, where are you? You've won, you've won, get in here. What? And I went running in and they were still applauding. And so I went to the microphone and as I passed in the wings of the backstage, there was this, oh, this wonderful young singer crying. She thought she was gonna win and she should have, I thought. So when I, the applause was dying by the time I got there and I thanked everybody for making me the winner. But I said, you know, really, this girl ought to go uh, to New York to represent us on the Ted Mac Amateur Hour. That was the first prize, an audition, not a guarantee, but an audition with the Ted Mac Amateur Hour. And 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 I said she should go uh, because she's more likely to win that, you know, to win the audition and get on the show and represent Nashville. No, you got to go. You're the one that we got the most applause on the applause meter and the judges. And so I had to go, and 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 I did with trepidation, because I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm just another guy who can sing a pop song. But I did go on, and I sang, "I believe for every drop of rain." I didn't I didn't preface it with with side by side, and to my amazement, the cards and letters that was a Saturday night in New York, and the cards and letters by Thursday would decide the winner and whoever the winner was would come back and compete again. Well, I was again, so sure I was not going to win. I was just glad that I got on and represented Nashville. All of that, as I say, I won a, a second and a third time, but nothing came of it, Harvey. I know I accept a guy named Randy Wood of Dot Records took a mental note of a homeboy who had been winning these contests, but he didn't call me for a year. And I get the call from Randy Wood of Dot Records out in Gallatin, Tennessee, outside Nashville. Hey, I saw you a, a year ago on the Ted Mack show. Do you want to come back to Nashville or, or Chicago and make a record? I said, well, sure, I'd love it. So he sent me a ticket to Chicago. I went to Chicago. I recorded a rhythm and blues song called Two Hearts, Two Kisses till midnight. And one heart's not enough, baby. Two hearts will make you feel crazy. One kiss will make you feel so nice. Two kisses take you to paradise. Two hearts, two kisses make one love. But he woke me up at nine in the morning saying, we got a problem. What? Frank Sinatra just recorded that song. Doris Day just recorded that song. A group called the Lancers and the DeCastro Sisters also just recorded that song. And you're the only one that, that's not already a recording artist. I got to send you on the road to 20 cities in 18 days, as it turned out, to promote that record. And that by now I'm expecting our first baby. I, and I think, well, if this is a recording business, I can't do this the rest of my life. You travel the road to 20 cities in 18 days to promote a record. And so I was already beginning to write it off but the record went on to become a million seller immediately in, Mar in March of 55. So in, J in May of 55, he had to do a second record. So I went <laughs> back to Chicago and recorded Ain't That a Shame, Fats Domino's big hit. And that became an instant million seller. And, and from then on, for four and a half years, I was never off the record charts. That is correct. You've never been off the charts. Can you remember how you felt when you heard your voice singing on the radio for the very first time? 
I do, and I'll I'll even top that because it was it was it gave me goosebumps and, and of course a sense of, of pride, accomplishment. But I was smart enough, I felt I'm not gonna bank on this. This is a once in a life, this is not gonna continue. I'm gonna I'm I'm married, we're expecting our first child already, and I'm gonna be a teacher. Whatever wherever this goes, I'll write it and see what happens. But I'm gonna get my degree. I'm gonna be a, so now. I had come, we were moving to New York in uh, October of that year at 55. And I'm in a cab headed across Manhattan. And we pull up to a red light again, a, a opposite a car. It was, it was hot. It was in August. And there was a fear three or four teenagers in this car and they had the radio up loud, Alan Freed on, on WINS. And I was hearing myself saying, ain't that a shame? And the kids were jumping up and down and saying, ain't that a shame? And and and, I'm th and I wanted to lean out of the window and say, that's me, that's me. I didn't do it. And we, we, we pressed on when light turned green and we moved on. But that thrill, I never got over because there I, I was hearing it, not just me singing it, but those kids jumping up and down in the back of that other car singing out loud my song with me. I wanted more of that. <laughs> well, you know, you were one of the first white artists to perform R&B music, like Ain't That a Shame, Long Tall Sally, Tutti Frutti. I know your original plan was to be a crooner and to sing ballads. Yeah. So whose idea was that for you to sing R&B? Randy Wood of Dot Records. And uh, he had this aggressive little independent label called Dot. And he was so um, such a great marketer and so aggressive. And also, I said there were, he had some radar sense of listening to songs and, and sensing what would be popular, what kids would like to hear. And so he's the one that picked out all of my early records. He's the one that had me do Tutti Frutti and Long Tall Sally and Rip It Up and and uh, crazy little mama come knocking, knocking at my front door, 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 the Eldorados at my front door. And of course, I didn't ask any questions. I changed a couple of lyrics, even in Little Richard songs. Boy, you don't know what she do to me. Uh, I changed that to Pretty Little Susie is the girl for me. <laughs> and, and Richard didn't care because I have a tape of his that uh, from a black radio station in which they were asking the black DJ, how did you feel when Pat Boone did your song, uh, Tutti Frutti? He said, I was washing dishes in a bus station in Macon, Georgia. I, my record was getting played on the radio on rhythm and blues stations, but it was called race music then. And he says, but I wasn't making no money. I was still washing dishes in the bus station. But when I heard Pat Boone did my song, I threw the towel down, walked out of there. I was going to make some money now. That's what he told the black DJ then. Well, and that's the exact point I was going to make, that one of the greatest aspects of your multifaceted legacy is that because a lot of the R&B songs you sang were written and originally performed by Black artists who mm -hmm. couldn't get played on white radio in those days, you, right. sir, have been mm -hmm. credited with introducing white audiences to R&B music, which ultimately led to rock and roll. And of course, you've done an amazing CD called R&B Classics, which I have to mention, you know, which just, I think, is such an important part of your musical history, don't you think? I, I was hoping you were going to mention it. So I had this CD of We Are Family R&B Classics, in which I don't just sing the, uh, the hits of these, uh, like the heavy metal classics that I did, but I sing their hits with them. And to my astonishment and, and gratitude, these people, these great artists that were hits at the same time, I was doing my own hits and they were R&B covers, as we call them, uh, version, my versions of their songs. I was not taking something from them. I was helping them cross over into what was largely white radio, pop radio. And, and recently, you wouldn't have any reason to know this, Harvey, but uh, when I did this album and I was on, on uh, the Rainbow Coalition station in Chicago with Santita Jackson, Jesse Jackson's daughter. She was hosting this program, maybe still does. 
And uh, talking about recording with James Brown, Papa's got a brand new bag. Hey, hey, Pat's got a brand new bag. And uh, and and doing the recording with them and Earth, Wind, and Fire and Smokey Robinson. And she asked the engineer, is that on the phone? Who is that? Is that who I think it is? Okay, put him on. It was Jesse Jackson, her dad. And it's a Rainbow Coalition station, Chicago. And he said, you know, I've been listening to the program. So we came to love Pat Boone, first by his father-in-law, Red Foley, singing our Negro spirituals, which he he did so well. And we and then we learned he had a son-in-law doing our rhythm and blues songs and not just singing the songs, but bringing Fats Domino, Little Richard, and the performers on his television show with him, singing their songs with them on TV. And I'm going to say something I've never said before. This is what he said then. I think Pat Boone did more for race relations with his music at that time than any other singer. I don't think there's any doubt of that. And it's it's kind of ironic to me because when you were growing up, the singers that you looked up to were people like Bing Crosby, right? Yeah, right. Bing was my role model. I wanted to be a guy doing romantic musicals and singing uh you know, all of these great songs, Moonlight Becomes You, and all those beautiful songs that Bing Crosby did, where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, someone waits for me, boo, 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 boo. I wanted to be like Bing Crosby. But now I was singing rock on, you made me cry when you said goodbye, ain't that a shame? And it, and my version of his song, as I've said, a Fast Domino song, his was roll, mine was rock. If you hear his record compared to mine, you me, boom, boom, me cry, boom, boom, when you said goodbye, ain't that a shame? But mine was loud, percussive. You made me cry, made it sound angry even. And I, an episode happened when I was appearing at the Fairmont Hotel in, in Louisiana, Louis, uh, New Orleans. And he was appearing at Al Hurt's place a jazz place and it was sort of little theater in the round he was down you could come in at the top and look down and there he was in the piano and and a little trio with him so i took some time off and went over in the evening after my show and to see fats performing and he didn't talk much but uh he just played at the piano all those hits of his but somebody told him pat boone's here and he asked me to come down and sit on the piano bench with him which i did and and uh, and he, as I say, he didn't talk much. He says, "Folks, I want you to see. You see this ring, and he had diamond rings on his fingers. But he, this was a big uh, diamond-shaped uh, ring on this finger." He said, "This man bought me this ring with this song. You made boom boom me cry boom boom when you and we we sang ain't that a shame together? Not my percussive kind of version, which was more rock. His was roll rolling rhythm." <laughs> and and uh, and so the rock and roll thing happened when Elvis, of course, began to record a Hound Dog, which Big Mama Thornton had recorded, and then other songs uh, that were rhythm and blues classics, like I was doing, and and he had hits with them, and we were helping bring all that over the phrase rock and roll, which was. a race music rhythm and blues phrase. We're going to rock and roll all night long, and. Anyway. Well, it might include dancing, but it might have included other things as well. Now, you and mentioned Elvis. A lot of people may not know that way back in 1956 at a big disc jockey sock hop in Cleveland, Elvis Presley was your opening act. What was it, it like having to follow Elvis Presley? Well, it, it was easy that night because nobody knew who he was. See, he was had just made one record on Sun. Uh, in Memphis, Sun Studios, and and the side, the A side, was a Bill Monroe bluegrass song, Blue Moon of Kentucky, Keep on Shining. Well, that wasn't rock and roll, and but the other side was uh, the the B side. When when he did that song, uh, sort of miming it with his two two uh, guitar players, and and Elvis himself was playing rhythm guitar, but you were not hearing them; you were hearing his record and pantomiming and i was when i came on i was pantomiming my three hits at that moment but he the kids didn't know who he was and bill randall the dj just had had uh, tom parker bring him up so he could hear 
this guy that uh, RCA Victor had signed and was excited about, but he hadn't even recorded anything for RCA Victor yet. So all he had to pantomime was his Blue Moon in Kentucky. And then when he did that and the kids liked the way he looked, they weren't sure about his music. As I was looking through the curtain, I could see they were like talking to each other, but that how cute he was, but what is that song he's singing? Didn't sound like rock and roll. And, uh, but he said, thank you very much. I liked it. He do the other side of that record for you. Hope you like it. And then he sang, that's all right, mama. That's all right with me. Any way you please. And, and that was rhythm and blues. And they loved that and wanted more, but that's all he had. So he, thank you very much. And he left. And I came out and got the screams that night and signed the autographs for all the kids because uh, I was on the charts. And as Elvis said later, when we got together the first time after that had happened and we were both renting homes in Bel Air and making movies side by side in adjacent studios at 20th. I said, Elvis, that first night we met, you seemed so shy and so bashful. You only said two words to me when I said, Bill Randall thinks some big things are going to happen for you. I don't know about that, but I hope so. And he just leaned back against the wall and they, your buddies closed in around you. Well, you, he said, I didn't know how to talk to you. I said, why? You were a star. I said, I'd only been recording since March. He said, he said, yeah, but you had three records on the charts. And I did honestly, as he said, didn't know how to talk to you. It was, Elvis was always socially uncomfortable. On stage, he was home, but talking to people he didn't know and in company of other people in other uh, walks of life, he always had his buddies around him. And he didn't he didn't like hanging out and just talking to people because he, I, and this is something I don't usually tell, but when I shook, I held out my hand to shake hands with him and he let me shake his hand, but he didn't squeeze me back. People, nobody had taught him, you know, a man takes a hand and, sh you know, shakes it even his own dad hadn't taught him. He let me shake his hand. <laughs> but And I never mentioned that to him because then, of course, he learned to give a manly handshake. But he was, he was I saw him then, and I'll always remember him, as a, a kid just out of high school, that's as far as he went in school, trying to find a way through life and doing music and finding that kids especially loved what he was doing. And he went full bore for that. Once he found something that other people liked, uh, that's what he dug into. And that became his existence, his life. W what did you think of the movie that was made about Elvis? Was that realistic from what you knew? Very realistic. And I that Austin Butler, Butler who played him, I, I haven't met him yet. But, you know, I want him to know that what an incredible job he did. Sometimes people criticize him. They, for some reason, I don't know what they find to criticize, but he learned to look like him. He learned how to sound like him too, you know, thank you very much. And the way he always talked. And, um, and he even changed it in episodes in his life. Austin was that keen to change his, his sound of Elvis's voice as he got older. And the more he talked, the more comfortable he got in public. There was that one moment in his early career when uh, the, the press was asking him, you, you, any, uh, any other singers? Who do you like? What other singers do you like? And I have the tape. He said, well, and Pat Boone, he said, he sings ballads better than anybody. I had records of his when I was, before I was recording. What do you think of Pat Boone? I think he's undoubtedly the finest voice out now, especially on slow songs. Uh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not saying that to make me look good. I actually think that. I mean, uh, I, I thought that, you know, Boone was recording before I was. And I bought his records even back then. Well, that had only been <laughs> a year, maybe before, when he'd heard my songs. But he was saying, he was giving me that compliment uh, that Pat, the way I sang ballads. Well, we we became such good friends that we, you know, he would come to my house on a Sunday afternoon and uh, we didn't have a gate at our, I didn't have a gate at our house till Debbie's career took off and too many young guys were coming to trying to get to Debbie. But, uh, I wonder but, why. 
I could tell you some stories about that too, but. I have to tell you that interviewing Debbie was one of the highlights of my year. I just adore your daughter. Well, she's still talking about it too, your interview, because you do the kind of background checking that nobody else does. And you know more about uh, people you're interviewing than they have forgotten about themselves, (laughs) as in my case. But Elvis would come in in the afternoon on a Sunday afternoon and my kids would jump out of the pool and uh, and go hopping up on this guy they only knew as a friend of, of daddy's. And uh, I'd say, girl, stop that. You're getting him all wet. Leave him alone, man. I like it. And he did. He wanted what I had, a wife and kids. Did you ever talk to Elvis about his lifestyle, about the path he was on and try to help him kind of uh, straighten himself out? Well, I had one episode in particular, and and I, we did not have time much time alone where we could talk privately about those things, except this one time when uh, he he was appearing at the International and his, his career was white hot, of course. And many things had happened. His marriage had broken up and, you know, sad things had happened. And we go back in the big closet, just he and I closed the door so we could be alone. And he says, I wish I could go to church like you do. I said, you can, why not? He said, no, if I went, I said, I'd be a distraction. The kids would be jumping up. They'd be clamoring for my autograph and they'd be, and I would distract from the preacher. And the, and I, I said, don't you think it happens to me if I, at that point in my own career, if I go to a church where I'm not a member and the kids want my autograph, do what I do. Just say, kids, I'm here for the same reason you are. Let me worship and I'll sign your bulletins after the service. And uh, and you can take them to school and you can show the other kids and they'll say, Elvis Presley or Pat Boone was at your church. Can we come and let it be an evangelical outreach? And he grinned and he said, no, I can't do it. He said, I'd be distracting. And, uh, and, and I just, but he says, but do you know Earl Roberts, the minister on TV? And I said, yeah. And he said, I'd like to talk to him sometime. I said, let me give you a clue. Your name is Elvis Presley. Get on the phone to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Operator, ask her for uh, Oral Roberts University. And then when the operator there answers, say, uh, 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 ma'am, I'm, Al- I'm Elvis Presley. I'd like to talk to Oral Roberts, please. And in 15 seconds, he'll be on. So you don't have to have anybody. You know, you can. But he was socially, as I say, he was not. He couldn't put himself forward to do that. And so uh, I did it. I, of course, called Earl Roberts, and he flew out and spent the afternoon with Elvis. And he said to me later, he said, he's spiritually starved. He went to church as a kid with his family. Of course, that's shown in the movie. It's exaggerated in the movie. But, I mean, some of what was shown was, I don't think it was (laughs) some kind of holy roller excitement that uh, was probably a little excessive. But he was involved in literal worship and sometimes in black churches. And he loved it and was influenced by their enthusiasm, by their uh, all out excitement in what they did. And he loved that and he missed it. But he felt like he couldn't go to a church without disturbing everything and distracting. So when Oral talked to Oral Roberts, he said, he said, I prayed with him, prayed for him. He prayed with me. And, and and I told him that he should uh, just do sort of what you suggested, go and ask the kids to just let him worship, and it'll be a great example. But Elvis was really, a, in that sense, a prisoner of his own uh, fame. I want to ask you, Mr. Boone, from 1957 to 1960, you hosted your own variety show, the Pat Boone Chevy Showroom. Some of the greatest singers of all time appeared on your show. Everyone from Ella, Pearl Bailey, Johnny Mathis, Dinah Shore, Mel Torme, Peggy Lee, Tony Bennett. I saw them all. Does it make you sad that we don't have variety shows on TV anymore? Very much so. And I'm hearing that there may be I think Katy Perry is is saying she might want to start a variety show. Yeah, where people sing live. Well, they you know the in a sense these award shows 
are variety shows, but they just pick a certain uh, only things that are up for Academy and get Grammy Awards. The reason that neither Elvis or I ever got Grammys in our lifetime is was we preceded the Grammys. All of our main fame and success, his three Grammys were gospel uh, given to him posthumously uh, for gospel things that he did. But none of his pop music or any of us, either of us ever got any Grammys. But the, the variety shows were what they claimed to be, variety. And the and performers of many backgrounds and all types and known and unknown. On my show back then, you know, the major stars who were so great, but they didn't have their own shows like Ella and Nat Cole and Sammy Davis and Johnny Mathis. They didn't have their own shows, but they could come on my show. And that was at the time and when I was having them and I was thrilled to have them on with me and, and uh, you know, to sing with Ella Fitzgerald, even do a little little bit of beginning of scat with her. <laughs> and and uh, she says, oh yeah. And she, we kept going in that song that we do together. She was uh, surprised that I was trying to be a little more, uh, what's the word, innovative with her but she could she could sing anything any any way and never miss the beat and never miss a note and for me to be singing with her was terrifying really but i rose to the occasion and then sang with george shearing uh, one of the best i ever did was stranger in paradise with with uh, george shearing in his quintet and uh and with all these great artists nat cole so now this is something most people don't know but on the end, toward the end of my third year, Chevrolet was getting a lot of problems with my show because of all the black performers that I had come on and sing with me. And I obviously enthusiastically sang with them. And uh, they were they were afraid of losing some of their customers. They were getting, because this was the late 50s, still the Southern prejudice, still rife. And I grew up in Nashville, uh, Nashville. I knew what it was all about, but uh, but I was thrilled to perform with these these performers. So then Harry Belafonte called me on the phone and said, I've been watching your show and I like the way you treat your performers, he said, your, your guests. Would you like me to come on and sing some show, songs with you? I said, are you kidding? Of course I would. So now we had the meeting, production meeting, with uh, Chevrolet, the, the the ad agency, the ABC people, you're not going to believe this. Harry Belafonte wants to come on the show and sing with me and free for nothing. Just and they said they had these stony looks on their faces. Well, that's nice, but we've got to say no. I said what? They said yeah, because we weren't going to tell you this. We didn't want to tell you that that Chevrolet is having real trouble with the show in the South. Uh, people are coming in. If you, if you, Pat, we like Pat Boone. We like the show. We, we're Chevy people. But if, if he keeps on having all those black folks and they didn't use that phrase, then we may have to switch over to Ford. I mean, this was literally happening. And so we, we can't have Harry. He's already very active in civil rights things. And uh, I was stunned. I didn't say anything for a while. Then I interrupted the discussion that had moved on. I said, wait a minute. It's called the Pat Boone Chevy Show, isn't it? Yes. If I if Pat Boone has to say no to Harry Belafonte, the most the top performer in the world, it's it's it's, it's making me tearful now. Well, it's just unbelievable. I mean, the Pat it's... Boone Show, and I'm going to have to ask you to take the show from here. I I will not continue on a show with my name on it. And they, they were stunned now. And they said, you mean, you're going to walk off your show? For, I said, look, it's not just because I'm, I grew up in the South. I know what it's all about, but I'm not going to perpetuate it. And they said, well, look, if we have him come on, can you guarantee there won't be any subtle or other civil rights statements made? I said, look, I can tell Harry Belafonte the situation. And I know he's a gentleman. And he and I singing together is statement enough. I'm sure he'll agree. And so I, I hoped, I wish I could tell you it happened, but uh, it didn't. I mean, when we didn't contact Harry because, A, I found out later he was already booked. He couldn't have done it that season. 
And then I was not going to continue the show after that. So I quit the show and went to specials where I would not be restricted about any kind of guest I would have come on. Harry, uh, I don't think he ever knew why I didn't call him back, but I eventually had the chance to play golf with his daughter, Sherry. And uh, I told her what had happened. And she had me get on the phone that day out on the golf course to talk to uh, Harry's wife and uh, that uh, she had not known, nor had Harry known why I never called him back to have him come on the show, but or the, why I didn't continue my show. <laughs> well, family. you know, it's so interesting that you had that experience back in the 50s, because I know that when the race riots erupted in 1991 after the Rodney King beating in Los Angeles, you mm -hmm. wrote a beautiful song called Can't We Get Along?, and when yeah. the Black Lives Matter movement began a few years ago, the song was recorded by Wendy Moten, who was a finalist on season 21 of The Voice. And yes. a very, very powerful video was made. Can't we get along if I offer you my... Can't we get along? Can't we all get along? Isn't that a full circle moment for you? Yes, it truly is. In fact, when I Rodney King came out of that uh, of the hospital uh, that day to meet the press for the first time, and the riots had calmed down, but he could have said incendiary things, which have made it all flame up again. But instead. In that cracking voice, he said, can't we get along? Can't we work it out? Can't we be friends? And I wept then, and I'm weeping now thinking about it. And I thought, well, Peter, Paul, and Mary are going to write a song. Surely, can't we get along? They didn't. Nobody did. So I did. I wrote the song. I recorded it. But I, did, I was not on a record label then, and I couldn't get it out there. I sang it with black choruses around L.A., but it kind of went away until the voice and Wendy Moten, I, I, and, and then the 20 riot, the riots in 2020. And I knew that song was what was needed, but not for a white guy like me to sing it. It had to be a black performer. And somebody recommended a friend of mine named Norm Ratner, a producer knew of Wendy Moten said she could sing that song and she ought to do it. She's had some other hits and she loved it right away. And she sang it beautifully and, and so we put out the record and it went viral all over the internet cr like crazy. And when she was on The Voice, I contacted her and I said, Wendy, you, you need to sing that song on The Voice because I've seen those audiences anytime on The Voice when performers sing anything of a spiritual nature. And if it's obvious that they mean what they're singing, they win. So you should, and she said, look, I've already tried. I've already tried. And the and the producers of the show won't let me do it. They don't want. They didn't particularly want that much of a spiritual song. I guess I don't know why because it was exactly what was needed at the time. But she said they wouldn't let her do it, and so she came in second. She almost won the whole thing. And I think if she had been singing that song, she would have. I do too. I think she would have. I want to ask you kind of a delicate question. When I was growing up people would say that you had such a clean cut image because it was well known that you didn't drink or take drugs. You were a family man. Did that ever bother you? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't usually say yes, but honestly, I was not going to change my lifestyle, but it bothered me when people made jokes as they often did. Dean Martin in his shows was part of his routine that Pat Boone, he's so religious. I shook hands with that boy the other day. My whole right side sobered up. And and the audience would laugh. <laughs> and and uh, Johnny Carson made a joke about my coming home from some party and with chocolate milk on his lips. Jimmy Stewart told me something, though, that stuck with me. He says, if you have a, a solid image, don't 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 do anything. Don't try to get rid of that image. Clark Gable had an image. I I I I I've got an image. 
Jimmy Stewart uh, would stutter a little bit. He says, don't keep your image. That's valuable. It keeps you different. And uh, don't you, don't you, if, if people think you're a goody two shoes and you're too good to be true, you live your life and you'll do well. Don't, don't, tr but I did do roles in movies that were against type and which I was happy to do. But I, I, the answer to your question, and I'm sorry to give you such a long winded answer, but that there were times when Elvis was Mr. Excitement. Now, we were the same age, six months apart. We were battling on the charts for that first year. And then, of course, he kept going, and my record sales dwindled to a degree and kept coming back from time to time through the 70 years. But but I was I would chafe a little bit that I was, he was Mr. Excitement, and I was that nice guy. Uh, well, you know... I always got the feeling that you didn't really care about things like public image because when you were really at the top and such a romantic idol, I mean, women mm -hmm. swooned all over you, you chose to develop a family act. You yeah. were not the solo teen idol sex symbol. You yeah. had your wife and your children on the show, yeah. which is yeah. pretty much the opposite of being the available womanizer. <laughs> well, exactly. See, I was not going to change my lifestyle. And and in the beginning of my career, it was fine because parents, it was fine with parents and fine with kids. But it was only after Elvis's excitement and then all that followed when rock and roll became, you know, took, took on all kinds of other lifestyles and all kinds of subject matter and now I I was the square, uh, I was the 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 guy that was, you know, different than the others and not hip. Well, it bothered me that I was not going to change my lifestyle by any means. Uh, and so, when the, my girls were became were becoming teenagers all at once, about the time when Debbie and the others were like 13, 14, 15, 16, and I had four teenage daughters and I was had, having to travel a lot. The only way I could think of to keep my four daughters in sight at all times was to do a family act. And Shirley was a great singer, inherited her talent from Red Foley, her dad, and taught the girls harmony. And she taught them the harmony they sang with for for their career. They they could sing so well that as we became a family act, the Boone girls did four albums on their three or four albums on their own, nominated for Grammys and Dove Awards, uh, Gospel Awards. And then we as a family got nominated for awards. But that was my way of keeping my girls, giving them the opportunity to be involved in the excitement of my career, but also the hard work, what they had to give up, the sleep and other things that they had to keep their school going while they were on the road with, with me. And they did, and they sometimes came back after three weeks on the road with me, even in this country or traveling around the world to the Far East and the Philippines and 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 all over the world, Israel. Uh, well, you know, I think it's remarkable that you put your family first, that you never succumbed to any kind of public pressure. And then, of course, in 1997, you made a huge splash with your album. It's actually one of my favorite Pat Boone albums, in a Metal Mood, No More Mr. Nice Guy. It was a collection of heavy metal songs arranged in a big band style. I love that album. You made a legendary appearance at the American Music Awards wearing leather and fake tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. Whose idea was it to make that album? Mine. Well, it was mine and, and my musicians. We, we were in England. My The musicians, the five musicians that still perform with me, and they're saying, we're touring, and they're saying, Pat, we'd love doing all your hit songs. The audience loves them. But, you know, that was years ago. Why don't we go in the studio and do some more songs together? They're great musicians. And I said, well, I'd love to do it, but what could I do? I haven't done 10 times already. I'd just be another Pat Boone album, and I'm not even on a label at this point. And they said, well, you never did any heavy metal. And I said, and we joked about me, the possibility of me doing a heavy metal album because of its screeching and screaming and cacophony of noise. And 
and uh, the lifestyle. And, and, and then as we joked about it, and, and I was going to have a lightning bolt that, you know, uh, through my hair and, and chartreuse socks and, you know, just how we were going to look when we did our heavy metal album, just joking. But then Dave Siebels, my conductor, said, you know, we've been joking about it, but there's some really good songs underneath all that noise that we could do a different way. I said, what different way? He said, big band jazz is what I'm thinking. Big band jazz. Well, oh, hey, I'm ready. I'd been, you know, when I was when I was doing the Pat Boone Chevy show, we had our own full orchestra and we did all did an album called Yes, Indeed, with full out big band Sinatra type music. And uh, I said, great, let's do it. Then. But what songs? What are you talking about? And they started playing me some of the songs. And when I heard, for instance, uh, Ozzy Osbourne's song Crazy Train, I thought, that's good social commentary. Uh, and how Kids are going off the rails on a crazy train because of the, the, the things they hear that are, this is, this is true, but no, it's not. And the uh, hypocrisy and the double standards and everything going on. And they're trying to make sense of it. And I said, that's a terrific song. And and so that was one. And then the songs I already liked, like Smoke on the Water. Uh, and uh, I found out that that was a true story of what went on. And of course, the song itself tells its own story. It's a folk tale. And so when I did some homework and I found out that these songs, even Stairway to Heaven, listening to Stairway to Heaven, a hypnotic, wonderful song, I, I knew that Jimmy Page and maybe some of the group were into witchcraft. And then, uh, but so I checked out the lyric of the whole song and there's nothing in the lyric at all. I mean, there's some odd lyrics that you don't know what they mean. Hedgerows and stairway going upstairs and for what you don't know. <laughs> but that's just to the imagination of the listener. But when I recorded that song, I... I was just amazed at how the quality of it. And it, uh, it was and, sensational, a sensational album. But after that album came out, your gospel music TV show was canceled by the network because they said you were dabbling with the devil. How did you get them to reinstate the show two months later? Well, I was surprised that Christians were watching the American Music Awards to begin with. Oh. But uh, <laughs> but they were, and I, maybe because... I don't think it was announced that, that I was going to be on uh, ahead of time. But Dick Clark, who produced the show, he had heard my album and he thought it was going to be a big hit because all the songs had been big hits already in one collection and big. And he heard the music and he thought it was going to be a hit. He had a good sense of it. And he had Alice Cooper, who was a friend of mine and now had become quietly a, 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 a serious Christian. But he was going to... Uh, wear a v-neck sweater like this and white buck shoes and come out with a glass of milk his hair pulled back under a golf cap and he was going to be me persona wise and i was going to come out in this heavy metal outfit designed by bill Ballou, who did the costumes for elvis and his concerts and he's the one that created this vest with no no it was open down to the navel and my pecs showing and no sleeves and i had uh you know, decal tattoos and the choker and all that. So I came out as Mr. Heavy Metal through a heavy fog and I was walking with sort of a stomping gait coming out because he in, Alice Cooper introduces me as the future of heavy metal. Dick Clark had, through the stage manager, had let me know that 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 they were a little ahead of schedule. If I had If I had a little time and wanted to play with it, I could. Well, I didn't know in what way he didn't suggest anything and so when the crowd went nuts when i was introduced as the future of heavy metal by alice cooper and i came out the way i did looking like i did in the crowd there was cacophony happening in the audience and i think what was happening was that young people were saying who is that and then the older people said well they said it's pat boone but it can't be well who's pat boone you and, looked really, really good. And I went out the next day and bought that album. Well, it was a hit. It, it went right up the charts immediately because of the songs 
and kids wanted to know, and they wanted to know what all the excitement was about and why I was kicked off Christian TV, which was announced the next day. Because uh, though I had let the uh, heads of those Christian channels know I was doing some heavy metal songs and I've gone over the lyrics, so don't worry about it. But they were getting telegrams. They were getting letters. They were getting phone calls by the millions, they said, saying Pat Boone's gone off to the dark side. We've lost him. Jimmy Swagger and Jim Baker, and now Pat Boone is gone. <laughs> He's going to be, be a heavy metal singer. And I knew that I had done my part of it, the ruse, too good, too well. I wasn't making fun of the music. I was making fun of, the, of me doing the music. But I was very serious about my uh, my my versions of those songs, which I considered very good songs. And so I weathered the storm, went back on Christian TV a couple of months later with 70 Christian bikers who parked all their motorcycles out in front of the TBN studio. And they tattooed and, you know, they were Christians. But and I said on that program, I learned a great lesson how quick we have been we Christians, to to make judgment on other people by their appearances and by some of the things they may do or say, we judge their character and uh, their you know who they really are as people. And I said the Bible itself says, "Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you judge, you will be judged." And I'm confessing that I had been judgmental myself about heavy metal performers and their music, but when I did some of it and came out looking like one of them, I got judged as I had judged. And I, I have merited that. I take it that I'm being criticized, but I'm no more guilty of anything than they are for doing their songs and doing the way they do them. Well, you know, you're, you're such an ambassador of inclusivity. It's just such an honor to get to talk about these things with you. Now, you've just finished making a movie called The American Miracle, where you play Thomas Jefferson. Yes. What was that like? What an amazing honor. And uh, <laughs> uh, t t talking about some of these things happening to me, forgive me if I get a little emotional, but, but to be chosen to play Thomas Jefferson, the one who said, who, who created the phrase, all men, are, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. I can't think of a better person to portray him, sir. Well, I've even portrayed Tom uh, Abraham Lincoln in another. But to be him in the latter stage of his life in this, the purchase, the Louisiana purchase, and the disagreements he had with John Adams, his dear friend, but they, they, were, they differed in some ways politically, but they, they were great pals. So here I was as Thomas Jefferson uh, in the last days, and he's, writing a letter, but I used my voice as Thomas Jefferson. And I asked the director before I did the thing, I had a lot of, of speaking to do as Thomas Jefferson. He's He was a Virginian. Do you think, should I have a little Southern accent? He said, yes, that would be, he was very Southern. So I had to uh, say what I was saying as Thomas Jefferson as a Southerner. And I do that in the film, but I'm in the death scene uh, the last hours of his life. Of course, I have to ask you, since we're talking about a movie, of all the movies you made, do you have a favorite? I, I can tell you my two favorites of yours are April Love and State Fair. But do you have a favorite? Yeah, I do, but for a different reason. I mean, for just what people ask me, which is which do you like better, singing or acting? I said, as much as I love singing, I, I also love acting almost as much because I love being someone else. I mean, I have been, in a sense, locked into a lifestyle, which is my life and my style, but it's fun to maybe be somebody else and even play somebody that's very unlike me, which I've done a time or two. So movies is 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 was fun to make, but the the one that means the most to me State Fair, great. Uh, Richard Rogers did a song, wrote a song for me for that film. And to have the half of Rogers and Hammerstein write me a song, Pat Boone, to do a new song and introduce it, willing and eager. 
in the film and then a record. We had a hit record of the song. And Margaret sings part of it with me in the scene in which I did my first real smooch, screen kiss, and perform with her. But but the, the, the film that comes that stands out most for me was The Cross and the Switchblade. It was not, it didn't have the theatrical district. It did appear in theaters all over the world and was translated into other languages. I played David Wilkerson, a man I knew so well, who went into Brooklyn and the Bronx in the, that awful period when gangs were forming and, and fighting each other. And he went in as a preacher uh, out of Pennsylvania, a small town, to go in to try to reach them and help them. And that's where the film The Cross and the Switchblade comes from. And Teen Challenge, the great drug fighting organization, which is still, it is now still proven the most effective drug fighting organization there is, is Teen Challenge. It gets people totally off drugs forever and, uh, and gives them whole lives to live. So I played Dave Wilkerson in that film and got the great compliment from Dave himself by when he came to see some of the rushes, he said, you were getting it to look like me. I don't look like <laughs> he was thin. He was very energetic, very kinetic and vigorous, but I had to play him. So I did my best to play him in the film and for him to say to me that you, you look like me. I, I believe you're me in this film. You mentioned Anne Margaret and you in State Fair. You recorded a duet with Anne Margaret, Teach Me Tonight, on her new album, yeah. Born to Be Wild. Yep. And I want everybody to know that you are on that album because it's a great duet. Were you in the studio together when you recorded the song? No. In fact, that's that's the great part of this particular story. In fact, I just thought of, I sh we should have called it Hers is Born to be Wild and accompanied by Born to be Straight. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but but no, she had d done the recording, much, most of the recording with other singers and uh, and done the tracks of the song she was going to do. And she had already recorded her part of Teach Me Tonight. But she, I don't know if she had already chosen somebody. It didn't work out. But she contacted me through a, a middleman. And I said, I'd love to do a, a, a duet with Anne Margaret, but what is it? She's already recorded. Teach. I said, teach me tonight? Really? Well, I'll have to hear it. I don't know how appropriate that song is for the two of us to sing, teach me tonight, and two octogenarians. But, uh, but, but when I heard the track and she was already singing it, I, when I went in the studio with Dave Siebels to do my voice, I just couldn't do it totally straight. And uh, have you you've, have you heard my version with her? I sure have, and I love it. So you hear me, and they tell me it's the most played so far a song uh, in that album because it is so unusual because I'm, I'm making sort of fun of the idea that we're two 80 years old. I even say it during the instrumental of the guitar instrument, and I'm whistling. I stopped whistling to say, you know, I think we've come up with a great octogenarian love song. There are a lot of people that do not know that you wrote the lyrics to the theme song from the movie Exodus. And your connection to the state of Israel over the years is very strong. You were named the Christian ambassador of tourism by the Israeli government. You were given an Israel cultural award, which is the highest award that a non-Israeli can receive. You're also a spokesperson for the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. With and in 2022, you were presented with the Warrior for Truth Award in New York City. Do you have anything to say, Mr. Boone, about the wave of anti-Semitism sweeping the world right now? Well, of course I do. I, I have to say to the people of Hamas and anybody that does the marching, which sound, looks like Nazi Germany, hopefully that's beginning to cease of college kids carrying signs, not just supporting Hamas, which did that awful thing in that uh, terrible October day, destroyed some 1,200 Jews in the process, and now still hostages, and uh, and and has Palestinians all still being killed in this whole Holocaust. It's a fight against God. It's what I want people to know. When Ariel Sharon 
was prime minister to try to find some measure of peace with the Palestinians. He gave them Gaza, which then became a launching pad for missiles into Israel. It was it didn't create peace. It it created more outright war. And so for anybody to say they're going to drive Israel to the sea is 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 coming against God himself. You don't want to be on the negative side of God. See, the reason Israel is the target is because God made them his special or chosen people. And that made them number one target of his enemy, Satan. So everything that happens against Israel is fomented by God's enemy in the, in the I don't say heavenlies, but in another sphere, Satan is still God's enemy. He detests anybody that God loves. Uh, that includes Christians and Jews. And he's been God's enemy since the beginning of time as we know it. So, Mr. Boone, you are well known for your patriotism. Your song, Under God, recorded in 2002, landed in the top 20, became your 61st hit record. You also wrote For My Country, which is a musical tribute to the National Guard. Yes. What do you say to people, especially young people, who feel so disillusioned with all of the divisiveness within American society? Do you have a, a message for people today? I sure do. And I'm fine. I'm trying to put it in a song. And I'll I'll just have to um, uh, I'll just have to keep the title and the word separate because I haven't finished it. But I I'm trying to do a, a Bob Dylan type song calling for. Uh, people to be united again, uh, because Lincoln said, quoting Jesus, a nation divided against itself cannot stand. And the more divided we become, the more we're headed toward downfall. Uh, we cannot continue to be the nation that the Constitution created unless we make the Constitution the foundation as it was. Now, you are extremely well known for being a man of faith. It really comes through not only in your gospel music, but in your many books, which have been so inspirational and uplifting for millions of people. I want to mention three of your books, which have moved me very deeply. And then I want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. The first book I read was A New Song, in which you took us on the journey of your own spiritual awakening. Yeah. Then I read questions about God and the answers that could change your life, yes. which addresses fundamental questions about the existence of God and the meaning of life. Mm -hmm. And then the third book I read is your latest one entitled, If the Eternal Choice We All if. Must <laughs> Make. And in that book, you share some very important life lessons and you urge us to reflect on our lives in light of what the Bible says about God and our existence. So yes. my question to you, Mr. Boone, is this. If a person watching this interview is thinking to themselves, well, I don't understand how there can be a God who is good when so many terrible things happen in the world, what do you say to them? Well, that is an eternal, uh, everlasting question. And of course, I've had to answer it many times and uh, and think about it so thoroughly. As you, as you know, I think in my book, it, if I talk about that episode in the, in uh, Thailand, where I saw Buddhist monks burning themselves alive, immolating themselves as an expression of hope. Nobody knew exactly why, but a prayer for peace or an understanding or something. And it made me question my own faith. And I went back to the beginning and said, okay, I don't, I don't know what to believe. First of all, is there a God? And then I determined that just looking around at myself and you, and everybody else, the existence all around us proves there had to be a God and a creator. And I, I quote Einstein and Hawking in this book, as you as you know, and they said they don't subscribe to the Big Bang theory or any other evolution or any other. Even the theory of evolution, Charles Darwin, in, in his latter days, was a member of a Baptist church saying he regretted that his theory was taught to be anti-God. It was not. He believed thoroughly in God. And so the, the big question is, and I, I told uh, Larry King this because he asked that question himself on his, on his show. 
uh, why does why does so many terrible things happen to good people? If God uh, is God of love and He wants everything good to happen, why do bad things happen to good people? And I answered it this way because it had just come to me. I had come across an accident on the freeway and it was backed up traffic for miles by the time we got to it and the police and the and the medics were already there car had turned over and crashed and and uh and and then as, after you pass you, the traffic picks up again and we were praying for the in the car for those people in that car and that they would recover and now we pick up traffic and it, it occurred to me that this is an incredibly dangerous thing we do every day with hardly thinking about it going up the freeway that uh, every day millions and millions of us go down these freeways going three lanes four lanes five lanes 70 80 miles an hour uh, exceeding the speed limit quite often going each way and while we're doing that we're listening to the radio women looking in the mirror to getting their makeup straight eating talking to people, kids in the back seat, you know, doing those things. And as long as we stay between those lines, just those lines that are painted on the freeway, we're all going to get going where we're wanting to go. But let one car veer out off and that is not restricted by anything except his own action. But veers off, chaos happens to a lot of innocent people so often Innocent people are killed by things in, in by people departing from those lines that are on the pavement. Well, those were, I think, like the Old Testament and Moses, the law of Moses. Then Jesus came along, painted some other lines that were a little more forgiving, a little more merciful, but they were still permanent lines. But you could make left turns here and right turns there and get into the lanes and you could still veer off and go different differently. But just those lines that were on the pavement, if you don't obey them, now society as a whole, as, as, a, as, a, as a, a race of people, human beings have so departed from the lines that were put down on the freeway that the more we depart from the lines that are clear and, and uh, for our benefit and for our safety and for our good lives, the more we depart, the more things happen to innocent people, that was always happening in, uh, in 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 the Old Testament times. Innocent people were killed, but there is a God who is who welcomes. The Bible says, the "Precious in the in the sight of God are the death of His saints." And what does that mean? It means He can welcome them instantly into heaven. Those bad things do happen to us. He doesn't prevent us either individually or collectively from uh, veering off the patterns that he created for us. We can't prevent all the bad things that do happen because we're not all living the way God wanted us to live. If we did, there would, they wouldn't happen. But society at large is at odds with God. And innocent people do get and will continue to pay prices that, that are not theirs to pay. But he also presides over us and he and 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 he can welcome anybody he wants to into an eternal habitation, a life that we couldn't far beyond anything we could provide for our loved ones. And so I take solace in that. My wife went to heaven uh, uh, it's almost three years ago now. And, well, uh, I want to I that's a good point for me to take a moment to pay tribute to our beautiful Shirley. We lost her in 2019. She's your beautiful wife of 65 years. She yeah. was an extraordinarily devoted wife, mother, grandmother, author, humanitarian. We all loved her so much. And I know your fans want me to ask you this, Mr. Boone. How are you doing? Please call me Pat from here on. I, I will. Because I mean, we're buddies now. And, and well, thank, thank you for that. Your fans want to know, how are you doing, Pat, since Shirley passed away? How are you? I'm doing great. I mean, almost almost say sinfully that I could be as happy and, and active and doing things that are vital and important to me now as I am. 
too many things for us even to talk about, even with all the other things we talked about. My help you start the ABA and the three point shots and basketball, my the the charitable things I helped create, the the foundational, the the biggest deal in the history of Shark Tank, things like that, that I just keep doing. And and there now that Shirley's in heaven, and I say she felt like she was married to triplets, that I've been given some time missing her as I do very much all the time. But I feel I just can see her. This this is make believe. Maybe it's almost sacrilegious for her nudging God, saying, God, uh, Pat's too busy again. Get rid of some of those things so he can at least do well what he has to do before you bring him up here for us to be together again. You know, he broke his hip already uh, exercising. <laughs> And now he's on a cane and he's going right back to performing and making appearances on television and recording and writing books. And can you do something to slow him down? I get I, I get those images, those impressions. And, and I'll tell you this, that as one of the reasons that I do believe this, the, um, the, the about a week or six days after her passing, we had a memorial service at the church where we were members and a big auditorium and hundreds of people. And uh, I told them this story that the uh, on the eve of that memorial service, we had a bunch of family here in this den where I am now. And the girls, four girls were upstairs uh, rehearsing a song called Make Me an Instrument of Your Peace. Beautiful song. And they sing it so well together. And they were going to sing it in the memorial service. So since they live in different states, hadn't sung together for a little while, they were rehearsing. Now, suddenly it was interrupted by some excitement and cries and noise coming from the front door at the foot of the stairs. So we got up and ran in. What's happened? The girls were still upstairs. At the foot of the stairs, we had an acorn chairlift, which I'd gotten so that Shirley and I could come up and be together even when she was in a hospital bed here in the den for months dying from vasculitis, which was a big question. I still have to ask the Lord. I think he's given me some answers as to why she was allowed to suffer the way she did, sweet and perfect woman as she was. And uh, anyway, this acorn chairlift was so we could take her upstairs. We could, it's the last month or two of her life, be together in bed. And uh, and the the kids said we were rehearsing. We stopped in the midst of our rehearsal, and we heard a click and a whir, and we looked around the corner down, and the acorn chairlift came up the steps by itself. Harvey, it can't happen. Mechanically, it can't happen. Uh, it, you have to be sitting in it. It has to have weight in the seat. You have to turn it on. You have to give it, to press the lever to go to the right or left. By itself, the acorn chairlift went up to the top of the stairs and stopped. We knew <laughs> that was her pat we knew that surely now you say well why didn't she why wasn't, wasn't she visible the world of the spirit is just as real as the world of the physical but she was not to be seen but i think god let her cause that seat to go acorn chairlift to go up and stop at the head of the stairs so that we would know she was there to hear her girls sing Again, absolutely Absolutely. And you made a beautiful video of a duet you sang with Crystal Gale called Just You and I, honoring your relationship with Shirley, sharing yeah. beautiful, beautiful memories, photos with us. And I want to play that video for our viewers now. Just you and I Sharing our love together And I know in time We'll build the dreams we treasure We'll be all right Just you
Just you and I Just you and I Sharing our love together And I know in time And I know in time We'll build the dreams we treasure We'll be alright Just you and I And I Remember our first embrace That smile that was on your face The promises that we made And now Your love is my reward And I love you even more Than I ever did before Just you and I Just you and I We care and trust each other With you in my life With you in my life There'll never be another We'll be alright And I And I Remember our first Embrace That smile That was on your face The promises we made And now Your love is my reward And I love you Even more Than I ever did Before was such an emotional and poignant video thank you so much for sharing your beautiful wife shirley with all of us well that it's emotional for you is is thrilling to me because of course it is obviously i mean she'll always be she always was i mean i didn't get tearful uh about her since she left i mean i was tearful when i talked about her in person when she was there because she was the sweetest best half of me there ever could have been. And God created her and helped her to be the woman that I needed to be, have as a wife and the mother of my kids and to teach them what was right from wrong. And uh, it, 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 it moves me so. Well, I have to tell you, Pat, it's been such a great honor meeting you. There are truly no words to adequately express my admiration and my respect and my love for you. You are a unifying force from those earliest days when you were singing R&B music, you were a unifying force on your television show. You've been a unifying force for the world in the songs you've written and in the messages that you give us all, regardless of what religion we are. Yeah. And I just want you to know how deeply touched and grateful I am that you took the time to appear on our show. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> well, I, I don't have like Debbie, I don't have appropriate words because there is nobody, and I've done 
countless interviews. There's nobody who does what you do in the way that you do it and the and the work you put in beforehand and the non-judgmental uh, approving way you have. It made me look forward to this and it's been everything I thought and hoped it would be. It was such an honor and I thank you and I hope you will always, always know that you are a highlight of so many people's lives. You've touched us all so much with the way you live, with your philosophy of life, with your beautiful voice, with your beautiful family. And I just can't thank you enough, sir. <laughs> well, I, all I can do is again and again, thank you. And, and say, maybe, if you ever decide that you want to take up some of the other chapters that we haven't discussed, I'll be here. <laughs> thank you. Let's do it. Our guest has been the legendary Pat Boone. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistants, Rosa Puzo and Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.